hands up questions. Yes. Um, yeah, go on. Thanks for, for the presentation. I have a quick follow up on the DEN test because I hope that the DEN test might provide some answers to the initial presentation by Mark, showing that there are, are some, that there is some scale norming as a potential pitfall of our measures. Um, you said that the DEN test is kind of confounded by recall bias. And I wondered whether you're you know about how severe this recall bias is in terms of the question of life satisfaction. And so this is the first question. And, and then just a general evaluation from your side, kind of <laughs> overall, how severe would you say is this response shift problem in the well-being research literature? So thank you for your question. Um, I think if you're interested in getting more information about life satisfaction, it'd be worth considering using uh, the appraisal measure or measures of the different domains. I think you'll get more information than with the then test. I just think the then test doesn't, uh, it, it's not only measuring recalibration, it's clearly got a lot of other content areas. And the recall bias, I don't have a percent in my head I could uh, share papers with you by myself and others where it was enough of a confounding to matter. Um, in, in one pop paper we did uh, with spine surgery patients, we found that it, the, um, the own, the, the pretty much the whole then test effect was explained by the implicit theories of change, which is, a, is about people's, are you familiar with implicit theories of change that they have a, an idea of what their past was like and that's kind of their, heuristic for answering questions. So it's not actually a good comparison. Um, the, um, what was your second question again? I mean, how, how severe you consider oh, problems. Yeah. So I'd like to kind of rephrase your, your question because um, it's really a pet peeve of mine that we a lot of people use response shift, talk about response shift as a bias. And every study I've done on response shift has indicated that it's important information. A bias is something you want to get rid of. And response shift is important information. It tells you a lot about the individual circumstances. So all the questions that have come up in, um, in the, in the discussions earlier today about norming and adaptation and um, ranking and calibration, all those things, those are, those are, um, you can get a lot of information about that with um, using appraisal measures. It'll give you really qualitative, interpretable information. And you can use that if you, if you want to understand how, what the results would be without response shift, you can create response shift adjusted scores, adjusting for those appraisal changes. And that I think is a more meaningful way to think about it. Um, I think that response shift is, um, it's an important phenomenon that's affecting most of our measurement of evaluative constructs. And that the, um, the, to talk about it in terms of the effect size is unfortunately confounded with the method you're using to work with it. So if you use, for example, the then test, it's a small effect size. And if you use the structural equation model, it's an even smaller effect size. And those have to do with measurement specific issues like the method issues. For example, in structural equation modeling, if most of the people in the sample have made response shifts, it will be very hard to find it. Similarly, if very few people in the sample have made response shifts, it will be very hard to find it. So you need sort of a, a sweet spot of people who've experienced that response shift to be able to even see it. It's a sort of a figure ground problem. So um, I can't really tell you an effect size because it varies depending on the method. 
but I can tell you it's important and it's incredibly relevant to what everyone's talking about, understanding subjective well-being. And the idea of a contingent true score, I think, really gets at the center of what we're talking about here. Because if you want to be able to compare people, you need to know that they're using a comparable frame of reference, standard of comparison, et cetera. Uh, I think Christian's raising his hand. Is that true? Thank you. Well, Christian was stretching his arm. I saw oh, Jan okay. waving. Was 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 Jan? Was that a was you was that a clap or are you raising your hand? Uh, Jan did. Uh, uh, Mark has a question. Yeah, thanks. Uh, am I mute? No, I'm off mute. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, thanks. Really interesting presentation, and I, I think great to um, share the kind of very long uh, history of research in this area. Um, I'm very struck that the kind of reduced form survey is 28 items. Um, so in a lot of our kind of um, policy relevant work in this space, um, I'm working with a charity at the moment um, who work with people in poverty and, and they're interested in, in kind of contributing to people's thriving, which I think is one way of talking about quality of life. And for them, like even three questions um, is, is kind of an overload. Um, and so we were thinking, well, maybe something like a life satisfaction scale is, is more parsimonious, but then some of the interviews um, with the kind of lived experts, the people that have been through um, working with the charity have suggested for various reasons um, that those would not be good. Um, but I'm wondering uh, just kind of whether you've, in, in applying this 28 item measure, whether there's been any, any difficulties with, with the length of it. Um, and yeah, just any, any kind of practical experiences on that front. Yeah, I can answer that. Um, we did actually a study looking at um, perceived burden of um, the measures and it was, and this was in a context of the 86 item version plus a one hour interview. And it was, and it was with bladder cancer patients who, I mean, that is a, such a difficult condition and the morbidity after surgery is such a difficult time. And what we learned was that they didn't experience it as burdensome. They experienced it as um, being cared for, that they were being asked um, about what was centrally important to them. They felt like they were seen. And I think what um, we found this pretty much across the board with the very long um, like resource intensive version where you had to code all that information through the 86 item, people find it meaningful to answer the questions and it makes them think about things that um, are uh, you know personally meaningful it's it's like it's a it's a double positive they're telling you something that you want to know and they're getting to think about something that they don't think about that often. Um, the other thing I would say, uh, one of the, I, I was, when I originally sent the abstract to uh, you for the workshop, I was going to also include information about a new method that we developed for assessing or for estimating responsive effects without direct assessment. So I'm calling appraisal on a direct assessment and without direct assessment, trying to work with the data that you have that you, where you don't have appraisal. And it's a couple papers that came out in um, quality of life research this month using random effects models and equating um, to get at response shift. And the first step in that model involves using what I call a magnet for response shift, which is using like what you're talking about, these broad sort of vague questions about well-being and life satisfaction where you're sort of putting it out there and letting people answer with whatever comes to mind. I call that a magnet for responsive because uh, I can't think of a better way to get people to tell you that there's a responsive going on when you collect that over time. It's, it's, it's the vagueness is a power if you use it. If you don't use it, it just means that you can't really compare people either to themselves over time or to others because you don't know what they're thinking about. And that's why that's why we've done so much work on appraisal. We really feel it's the fundamental unit or as Joel Finkelstein says, the genetics 
the genotype behind the phenotype, underlying the phenotype. So I think you'll find if you use, you could, you could just use a subset. You could use just standards of comparison. That's like, I think six items, seven mm -hmm. items, something like that. I think anything you use with appraisal is going to help. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be 28 and it doesn't have to be 86. You can just choose a domain that's most relevant. I mean, from what people have talked about, I've heard a lot of standards of comparison and combinatory algorithm in the morning uh, for afternoon for you um, so far. Okay. I just I just briefly want to say I'm very struck how how different that is from the kind of um, behavioral perspective that I'm used to, where uh, kind of asking any extra information around the life satisfaction question will just taint the life satisfaction question. Um, whereas it seems like what you're suggesting is that we need to kind of gather more of that and then use it in some rich way. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Bruce, would you like to add? Unmute, unmute yourself. Oh, sorry. Are you, um, oh, we can hear you now. Good. Yeah. Uh, just quickly, I put the paper on burden uh, that, that was published a couple of years ago in, in the chat so people can refer to that. I, I was going to say also that concern that you just mentioned about contamination is is an issue, and one of the things we've tried to do is ask the well-being or the you know evaluative questions first, and then probe later, whether with open-ended or more uh, you know closed-ended brief uh, appraisal measures that Carolyn was talking about. What one of the things that I my takeaway from this issue about burden, a lot of the research I do is community-based participatory research. And I think burden is probably more about the relationship between the person who's the research participant and the person doing the interview or their understanding of the study. And if, it's, if they see it as a meaningful exchange and you're asking these questions because you care or they see what the benefit of doing the research is, then it's not burden, it's a conversation, as Carolyn said, about what matters to them. And we, we did a study of very low income people in New York State with, with HIV and AIDS a number of years ago with the very first version of the Qual app. And that, Carolyn showed one of the slides had data from that. And it, we, we measured people at three different occasions separated by six months. By the second occasion and the third occasion, people knew what the measure was, and it was an open-ended interview, they would get compensated for the interview no matter how long or short they spoke, and they tended to speak longer and give more information at each subsequent interview. And so, be, because, you know, we had interviewers who were from the population, who were trained to elicit that from people. So I, th I think the idea of burden is more about how we engage participants than it is about a characteristic of a measure. So I just wanted to put that out there as well. Thank you. So I'm actually, I'm gonna exercise the chair's prerogative and, and jump in. So I think I'm interested in this idea of health related quality of life. And I suppose I'm tempted to ask sort of like, what's it for? So what's the purpose of understanding these these kinds of scores and i and the reason i ask that question is that i mean i can understand how someone's perception of their health is going to change over time but what i really want to know is what's happened to their well-being um and i'm imagining these concepts of kind of happiness and life satisfaction we've got kind of a better idea of what they are whereas health does seem much more contextual so um yeah, I'm sort of curious as to how, how this fits in and what purpose it serves and how you see it as related to well-being. So health-related quality of life or quality of life for short is generally measured by studying physical, social, and emotional well-being or functioning. So well-being, subjective well-being is part of that construct. And we call it health-related quality of life because we're working with medically ill patient populations, but it's really operationalized with a, a, an array of measures that ass assess different constructs within that. But the stuff about response shift relates to people's perceptions of their, their health or? 
it relates to anything that's evaluative. So I could pull up another slide if that would be useful. I mean, there's three types of, uh, let me just pull up another slide. Give me one second to pull it, to find it. One way I think of it while Carolyn's hitting the slide is that it's really questions where there truly is no right or wrong answer, right? I mean, it's all from the person's internal perspective. So if you're asking someone to evaluate how much difficulty they have going up a flight of stairs, if, if you can measure how long it takes, that's accurate measurement. But if you say, how hard was it for you? That's completely subjective. And we need a different way to understand that. So that so, uh, but the same thing is true if you ask people about the quality of their marriage, the quality of their housing, the quality of the water that they drink, um, their social activities and opportunities. All of those are within the person's frame of reference, and that's what we're trying to understand. Okay, I'm going to just. Um, can you? Let's see. Can you? Can you I think Carolyn still wants to put up a slide first, but, yeah, yeah, and then I will. I had it up and then it didn't. Okay, so. Okay, can you see my screen? Okay, I just did it again. We can see that. I know, but that wasn't the one I wanted. Okay, but can you see it now? That's fine, yeah. I don't know, it's not behaving. I wanted you only to see this, but let me just, uh, there, can you see that? Yep. Okay. So we make this distinction between performance-based perception-based and evaluation-based. And so evaluation-based is where the action is with response shift. In a performance-based measure, um, the measurement process is independent of judgment. And when you see a discrepancy between expected and observed, it's called error of measurement. In a perception-based measure, and I should say it's you would adjust for recall bias there, for example. In a perception-based measure, such as how often do you walk up a flight of stairs, the measurement involves judgment, but the raters are expected to converge. And if you see a discrepancy, it would be called response bias, and you would adjust, for example, for in implicit theories of change. An evaluation-based measure, how difficult is it to walk up a flight of stairs? In there, the measurement involves judgment using idiosyncratic criteria. If you see a discrepancy there, that would be called response shift. So that distinction is important because pretty much any time you're working with evaluation-based measures, you may be blessed with response shift. I'm glad that brought a smile to someone. <laughs> Okay, so we've got um, just five more minutes. So, Casper, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Um, so, first of all, I, I, I'm sure this is on everybody's mind, but how how large the gulf is between sort of the the economic social science of subjective well-being and the the quality of life type research, and I think that was brought out quite strongly. In particular, how how few questions sort of the economic subject of well-being people use in, in comparison to the quality of life people. And so, so my question, I suppose, then is, Carolyn, if you had, if you were allowed to ask two questions to get people's well-being instead of just one, so you get two or three questions at the very most. And what you want to get at is actually, is that person better off or worse off? And by how much is that pet person better off or worse off? broadly considered what what would you tell us people that that only have access to maybe three questions what what would you tell us to do so that's the first question and the second question is a clarification question and that is am i am i right in understanding you that that your contention is that 
that as soon as a response shift uh, in your terminology occurs, there's actually no, no, that we can't compare people as being better off or worse off, that, that this sort of comparison just, just isn't feasible anymore, that, that their well-being states are in that sense incommensurable. Okay, so the answer to your first question about only two questions, I guess there's a reason I'm not in ec economics. There's, there's no way I would only ask two questions if I wanted to understand subjective well-being. Um, and in terms of uh, when a response shift occurs, you can't compare people. Yes, that's what the contingent true score model uh, says. And that's also, I think, what the um, concepts presented earlier and the mathematical models presented earlier su suggest also. I mean, what, what does it mean? that you can't compare people. Well, you can, it's just gonna be wrong. Or, or, or you have to compare them multidimensionally, right? In, in other words, there's always underneath those numbers, one to four, one to 10, whatever you're doing, there's always a subjective meaning and context, but we can try to elicit that subjective meaning. I, I just was thinking about if I had three questions so I would ask some question like a Cantrell's ladder or some, you know, how do you rate your quality of life? The next question would be, what would have to change to make it better? And what would have to change to make it worse? You know, what changes would make it worse and what, what would have to change to make it? So wherever you are on the scale, what makes it go up? What makes it go down? That would begin to, and you could do that with checklists of, of criteria if you want to. I agree with Carolyn that the more information, the more context you provide, the more interesting, but we shouldn't, I was thinking that if measuring quality of life with a single item or a single number is kind of like measuring a chemical reaction only in terms of its temperature, right? Like it's up or down, but we don't know what happened underneath to yield that you know, temperature. And we don't have any idea of where it came from or where it's going. And so, I think we can provide richer, more contextualized description and compare people in those terms on the content and meaning of quality of life, as well as the up and down score of their evaluation. And there, it's all meaningful. And, and I should add, it's not just that, it's not, I mean, saying it's wrong is sort of a short way of saying there's a lot of error in what you're getting. It, uh, so you, you won't That's why we say eating error variance. Error variance eating the error variance because underneath all of those individual differences and temporal differences over time, it, it's, it's, it's information you can understand, right? You can begin to take that apart and the meaning and individual differences and inter-individual change doesn't just occur on the one to five scale. It occurs in the subjective context that people bring to the evaluation and we can understand that, or at least begin to understand it. And by the way, I got into this field because I was interested in the idea of oppression, right? It's like I was working with older adults in nursing homes for my doctoral thesis and how people's personal criteria for what counts as their life satisfaction gets kind of defined by the context they're in. And I, my advisor said, maybe people who are pissed off at the institution and not satisfied are probably happier or not happier, are probably better off than the people who say, yeah, nobody visits me, but it's fine, it's okay, it's not dreary. Um, so we began to think about this in a political way, right? That, 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 that the, the kinds of criteria people bring are shaped by their social and political context and people who kind of understand the context of their oppression or, 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 or their life situation may actually lower their, their quality of life by raising their standard of comparison and expectations. So, you know, I think, I think that those are the kinds of things that, that enter into this assessment. Okay, well, on, on that note, that's, uh, that's all we have time for from this session. So uh, thank you very much, Carolyn, with uh, interjections from, from Bruce there. So thank you very much. Uh, so we have a 10 minute 
Zoom break. So uh, please do whatever you need to do. And I'll see you again in 10 minutes for our next session.